know Blender friends, and possibly Blender enemies, and that would be anybody who uses vertice for the singular of vertices instead of vertex. It's vertex, people. So Modeling Cloth 3.0 slash 2.9 is out, and it's completely rewritten for the newer versions of Blender, and it has a lot of new features. Um, Modeling Cloth is primarily supported by StringKing.com, so check out StringKing.com. They have some amazing custom apparel and a lot of top-of-the-line sporting goods, and they also make a lot of equipment for COVID relief, and they have very generously agreed to let me share all of the work related to modeling cloth that I'm doing for their company. If you'd like to support modeling cloth, remember it's free to use, free to download. It is free to use commercially. If you want, you can rewrite it slightly and sell your own versions of it. It is completely free to use any way that you like. Um, but if you want to donate, that is very helpful and very much appreciated. You can purchase it on the Blender market, but if you do that, about $15 of the 35 that you spend actually goes to modeling cloth. The rest is overhead. It goes to the Blender market and other things. So if you want to support us, I strongly recommend you donate. So getting right to the features. All right, so the basics. Once you get modeling cloth installed inside of Blender, you will have this extra tab here called Extended Tools. And from there, once you add an object, you'll get all of these settings will pop up under the Extended Tools tab. So I'm going to subdivide this, and then I'm going to say that it's cloth. So now I've calculated all the stuff to make this work as cloth, and I can run in continuous mode. And when I do that, this will behave as a cloth object. And it currently runs in edit mode. So I've eliminated the grab tool because the grab tool is basically for doing what you can now do inside of edit mode. And doing it this way inside of edit mode gives you a lot more options than the grab tool had before. I can scale and rotate and grab whole sections if I want. And it currently freezes when you select everything. It goes back to running for whatever is deselected. That's the basics of how to make it behave like cloth. All right, so let's look at the basics of object collisions. So first thing I'm gonna do is add a cube and I'm gonna add a subdiv modifier on it and I'm gonna set it to like three subdivisions in the viewport. And then to make this a collide object, I click on, so I'm still in the extended tab and I click on Collide, and now this is an object that will be detected by Modeling Cloth Collisions. Um, now I'm going to add an object that I will make my cloth object. I'm going to subdivide it like so-ish. And yeah, actually let's do that. Centered. And now we're going to make this cloth object, and let's make this a different color so it's a little easier to see. So I'll have to add a material to that and make it green, or that's a cool color. Um, yep. Now let's um, set this to continuous, and so this is working, it's cloth now. And let's give it some gravity. So we give it some gravity and it's going to fall down onto that thing. And now. The modeling cloth add-on doesn't really like sharp edges. It prefers sort of rounded stuff, and that's a bug that I'm working out. But for now, it works pretty well, for the rounded stuff at least. Um, I am going to decrease the gravity because it's kind of making it look like drooping jello or something, pulling a little too hard. Okay, so the collision object, if you have issues with like Oh, let's let's do something crazy here. All right, obviously I've messed up my collision by doing that. So we're going to reset that. And I probably don't need so many subdivisions. So we're going to turn it down by one. Um, if I have like something protruding, for example, which is kind of difficult to do, but let's make it protrude. So we're gonna change the outer margin to something super tiny. And now it kind of sticks out 
Um, in order to fix that, we can change the outer margin, and this is all going to depend on the resolution of the cloth. So like if you use really high resolution cloth, then it can bend around these corners a lot more easily. But if you want to keep it ro lower resolution so that it performs a little better, you can cheat a little bit by setting the outer margin of the collider object up. So I've got my outer margin or uh, uh, collision object detected, and on my outer margin setting, I'm going to turn this up a little bit and st until the um, object stops showing through. And that's your basic way of uh, getting the collisions to look better. You can tweak that a little bit. So another thing that you can do now with this new version in collisions, I have control over static friction. So right now the friction is set to 0.5. 1 means it won't slide at all and then 0 means that it slides 100%. It just completely slides. And static friction means that it has to pull to a certain amount before it will start to move, which is more realistic behavior. So when a certain amount of force is applied from gravity or from another collision or from whatever is pulling on it, then it will start to slide. Um, and if I set the static friction and the friction of this object down to zero, so the friction is zero and then the static friction is zero, then there's nothing that's preventing it from sliding. So it'll just slide all over the place with no resistance whatsoever. And it'll just keep going and slide right off unless you set the friction up. So now the friction's really high. With the friction really high, it basically is going to move 100% and it's not necessarily going to be super realistic because, um, well, in real, the real world, you very rarely have 100% friction, and it'll be more realistic if you can set resolutions higher and subdivisions higher, but the, you take a performance hit the higher resolution you set everything. So a more realistic kind of friction would be um, like if you had a static friction of 0.1 or something like that, and then the regular friction at like something lower and it behaves a little bit more realistically. If we turn the static friction off completely and we turn up just a little bit of friction, you can see that it's actually slightly moving. It moves very, very slowly, and the speed that it moves with zero static friction and some friction up here depends on this friction setting. If you set it to one, it stops, and then if you set it to something smaller, then it slides, depending on what you set that number to. So those are the basics of object collisions, the, the friction, the static friction, the outer margin. Inner margin I didn't really talk about yet. Uh, let me talk about that real quick. Let's just move it over here, move it up here, and then reset it. So we can maybe take a look at what inner margin does. If you have um, the cloth, let's say the cloth is already penetrating the object. Like, you know, say your cloth is like this. Well, the inner margin will force it out of the object. Uh, basically, it gives a thickness inside of the object. So if I set the inner margin of this up, a little bit, then it's going to force it out, which will help to fix some of the object collisions. Uh, you use the inner margin carefully. You, basically, what you don't want to do, you don't want to have the, the inner margin so large that it actually like crosses over to the other side of the mess mesh. If you set the inner margin like super super big, it'll start to do weird stuff because it's sort of colliding with an invisible inside out version of itself. So you can play with that. And you'll have to set it based on the size and shape and stuff of your object. That's something that you'll have to just experiment with to get it to work correctly for whatever project you're doing. All right, so that's the basics of collisions, inner and outer margins and all that stuff. And since I've got the inner margin way too high, it's behaving all freaky. And that's basically how it should behave. All right, moving on.
Uh, now let's take a look at self collision. So same thing, add the mesh, do that kind of stuff. Make a cloth, run it continuously. Now it's running. Whoop de doo. Um, you'll notice that the object can pass through itself. You see how it's doing all that fancy stuff there, where it's just penetrating itself. So let's give it some gravity. Um, ta da, gravity. Way too much gravity. You notice it just goes right through itself. That's because it's not detecting object collision. That's probably too high. Turn that gravity down to something a little more realistic. There we go. So if we reset this and we turn on self collision, then when it crashes into itself, it's not going to pass through itself. It's going to stop, which is what you would hope for. And of course, I stop selecting the middle of it, so um, it, the whole thing is falling. I'm going to pause this and just add some shape to it. Oops. Some variety in the whatever. Okay, and then I'm going to run it again. And that way we can get kind of a better look at what it's doing there. Now, if I take like a section of this and let's see I have to set this to connect one for what I want to do here okay so now I have a section of the cloth has already passed through itself and I want to grab this again well it's going to continue to be collided with this error in it because self collisions basically prevent points from passing through other points so if it gets messed up, which it can do from various different things, then it's going to stick like this. Uh, for that, you can use the Flood Detangle. And Flood Detangle will basically resolve collision errors. Now, it doesn't perform as fast with Flood Detangle on, so you might just use it when you need it. So that's the basics. And you also have um, the self-collision margin. And you have a friction setting, which basically will slow down cloth that's colliding with itself. It doesn't work as well as the object collisions at the, this moment, but I am going to fix that, hopefully, when I get time. Um, one of the really cool things about the flood detangle for self-collisions, let's say you, had, you wanted to model something like, I don't know, a bunch of trash cans. And, oh, let's see. I know there's a way to apply, yeah, or trash bags. So let's make a bunch of trash bags. And we're going to duplicate this. And so you've got all these collision errors. So let's make these objects cloth. Well, actually, you know what? Let's just make this all one object. We're only going to join that. So this is all one object. And we're going to make a cloth. And we're going to set self-collision. And we're going to set continuous. And now these objects, you know, they're stuck together. It's got all these collision errors. And we want to fix that. So we're going to set flood detangle on. And it's just going to work until it figures out a solution to push all of those things away from each other. So let's reset this. And if I wanted to model this like these bags are sort of squished together, pretend they're trash bags, then I would turn the velocity down really low. And I would set it to run continuous with the detangle on. And it's going to look for a solution to push all of these objects apart. It's struggling a little bit with this area here, but it will eventually do that. So now I've got these objects are pressed together against each other and there are zero errors and you can imagine there's all kinds of cool things that you can do with this awesome feature 
And there are some settings with the flood detangle um, use at your own risk. Uh, basically, if you set some of these way too high, it, it basically will look for a solution in a larger area and some other things. The default settings tend to work pretty well, but if you are brave, you can experiment with the settings. All right, so that's the basics of self-collision. So let's do something useful as we look at some of the other cloth properties. And I'm going to model something that you might actually want to make at some point. Um, let's make a let's make a napkin. Now I'm subdividing this cube because the collisions actually work better on a subdivided object. There's a bug that I'm haven't had the chance to work out yet. Uh, so I want to make this a collider object because this is going to be my table. I'm going to do a folded napkin on a table. I want to make my table sort of table colored. What, brown or something like that? There you go. That looks like wood. This is my awesome table. I'll make a tutorial later on how to make such an awesome table. Um, this is going to be a collide. No, not cloth. I didn't want to do that. Oh, okay. Turn the cloth off. Turn the collide on. Now I'm going to add my napkin. And this amazing napkin consists of a subdivided cube. Subdivided about yay many times. And we make it cloth. We make it run. We make it drop with some gravity. It's sitting on there. And I want to fold it. So I'm going to grab it and make a fold. And the self collisions are off. So I need to turn self collisions on. And it's all tangled up. So maybe this will fix it. Oh, yes, I did that. That fixed it. Um, if I want to play around with the cloth properties, like, for example, we have down here uh, the stretch iterations. This is how stretchy the cloth is. We can make it really, really stretchy by turning this down, and it will sort of droop and sag, and it will be really, really stretchy. So it kind of behaves like maple syrup or taffy or something. Turn the stretch up, and it will make it stiffer. And I think the velocity is kind of high for what I want to do here. So I'm going to turn the velocity down to something and make it move a little bit slower. Um, you know, cloth doesn't stretch as much as this is. Maybe rubber would stretch that much. So you want to set the stretch stiffness higher for so, sort of more realistic cloth behavior. And then it won't droop as much or sag as much or whatever. And I've got the velocity set really low, so everything moves kind of like it's in slow motion. And setting the velocity low is better for modeling, usually. Uh, if you're doing animation, you want to set the velocity, you know, higher depending on what you're trying to animate and all that stuff. But if you set the velocity high, then it falls more realistically. Okay, so... If I wanted to get, like, let's say I wanted this to be a, st a stiffer, stiffer um, kind of fabric. And I'm just going to reset this because it can get messed up if it's like too folded on itself. Okay, so pretend this is going to be a folded napkin. And I'm going to pull it over here, sort of let it fall on itself. So that's the first fold in my folded napkin. And, uh, you know, if it's silk, silk is going to be really delicate fabric, and it's not going to be that stiff where it bends. So you would turn the bend stiffness down, and it will fold a little bit tighter with smaller bend stiffness. Or let's say you wanted to make it something like leather, so you'd want to turn the bend stiffness up, and that's going to make a much rounder fold a much stiffer cloth if you set this bend stiffness up higher. 
if you set the band iterations really, really high, it actually will perform a little bit slower because it has to run more calculations for stiffer fabrics. So keep that in mind. So let's set this something more like, oh, like a cotton or polyester napkin, I guess. Would be, you know, something like that, I guess. And then let's make another fold in it like this. which I did pretty crappy. Um, so we'll pause it there. And then let's shade that smooth. And let's add some subdivision to it. Wait, no, I can add a solidify, that's fine. Um, and a subdivision surface, which probably should go above that one. And now I have a lovely cloth napkin that I modeled in a few seconds. And I could make a bunch of these and make them all look different pretty quickly with uh, the features that I have here. So there you go, a little bit more about the cloth properties and maybe something useful you could do for fun, make a bunch of cloth napkins. All right, so another feature that's brand new to this version of modeling cloth is the grid tools. Here it is, where it says MC grid tools under here. And these are not super versatile. You have to use these with some constraints. Um, you need to be in top-down mode. So I, I hit seven on the number pad, and I'm looking straight down. And you need to have a polyline that's completely enclosed. And you need to have, basically, your enclosed polyline needs to be sort of the only part of this object. All right, so here's my enclosed polyline. I'm looking at it from the top down, and I'm going to say fill polyline. And um, it creates this object. And I can mess around. Here, I'm going to go into wireframe mode so you can see what it created. Okay, so here's my polyline that I've created. And I can tweak some of the things in here. So like I can change the size of the mesh it generates inside of it. Don't move too fast on that or it might hang up, by the way. It's going to hit a certain resolution where it's, you know, too much. It's currently filling with equilateral triangles wherever it can. Uh, you can set that to quads if you want to, but it kind of has to use triangles around the outside edge. So I prefer to use triangles. And these settings don't have much effect. Merge distance um, will affect the shape of the triangles around the edges to some extent, and the number of times it's smooth sort of evens out the uh, corners a little bit. You can see what that does. So the default settings usually work pretty well. And, you know, you can set the resolution of your cloth. So then when you turn this into cloth, you can pull it out of the thingy. And so now you got a piece of cloth. If you want to, you can, like, generate another one. Just created another one right here, and it's going to be cloth, and it's going to have some shape to it, and whatever. So, like, if you wanted to, uh, maybe I'll do that real quick. I'll just show you something you can do with this. All right, I'm going to see if I can, let's see, add-ons. There's a cool add-on. If you open up your preferences and go to add-ons, and it's images as planes, and I have it enabled already. Um, and the way that works, you do file, and import, and images as planes is an option if you enable that add-on. 
And I believe I have a pattern. Okay. And, okay, yep. So there's a, oh, ah, that's the wrong one. Let me go into my folder real quick. Let's see. MC29 images. Somewhere I have free t shirt pattern. All right. Oh, hey, that works too. Cool. So here's my t shirt pattern. I just dragged and dropped into my scene. And I'm going to add a mesh. And I just want, I want to be top down view for this to work. And I only want one vertex here that I'm going to turn into my pattern. So I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to model my pattern. We'll just do this real quick. Kind of dirty. You could obviously take your time and do this better if you really wanted to, which I'm not doing. You could also like mirror it so it's perfectly symmetrical if you wanted to give it a lot better quality. But I don't care because this is just for demo purposes. And now we're going to take this and we're going to fill polyline. And now I've got the first part of my pattern. Turn it into cloth and pull that part of it off. And that will be part of my t-shirt and I could go through and model the other parts and then I could sew them together. So there there you have it, the, the grid tools, MC grid tools, which by the way, they're pretty limited. You gotta do top down and you gotta be careful about these sizes and stuff, but there you go. Just something I threw in there because it was fairly easy to include in modeling cloth. All right, so you've seen the basics of the new version of modeling cloth. If you want, you can stop the video here and just start playing with it. This is the boring part of the video where I'm going to try to cover more extensively all the features. If you want to keep watching, this part's going to be a little bit slower, but I'll try to get through it as quick as possible. So let's add a cloth object. And this time I'm going to add a cube just because it's fun. And I'm going to make it cloth. And I'm going to show you uh, going down the list, the different features. So we have shrink and grow. And shrink and grow will actually uh, make the target springs larger or smaller. So it's going crazy because I'm basically saying target a larger size here when I turn this up. So I turn it up and now it's trying to expand out. And that's actually kind of a cool effect. So let's set that to one. And Oh, there's all kinds of things you could do with that, as you can imagine. Um, like, for example, say you wanted to shrink this object around an icosphere. So let's do that. We'll make that a collide object. We'll make this shrink around that thing. And now it's going to wrap itself around that icosphere that's inside of it. So it's in there. See that? Oh, look at that. It's like it's inside a giant squarish bag. How weird. Um, okay, I'm having too much fun here. Let's look at the next feature down the list. So we got shrink grow. Right under that is wrap force. Uh, for wrap force, let's do something different. Let's add our icosphere again. And let's add a plane. Put it up kind of here, oops, and give it some geometry. And now let's make this a collide object and make this a cloth object. And let's start it running and let's give it a little bit of wrap force, tiny bit. What that does is it basically draws this object towards the other one. So it's going to try to follow that object wherever it goes says, no, come get me, I'm over here. Come on, hook it. They're like playing tag. So, it's 
just drawn to it. Can't get away. It's like, I love you. Uh, yeah, so that's what Rap Course does. And I figured, like, if you wanted to make a bag of candy and shrink wrap it, well, you could use Rap Course to sort of pull the cloth towards the object. And you could use that with self poisons and other things. And it's pretty limited. Basically, it will work on whatever the first collision object is. Uh, if I put two collision objects in and I set the wrap force up, it's basically just going to target the first one. It will ignore the second one. It'll still collide with it, but it's only going to use wrap force on the first collider object. So that's wrap force. All right, what is the next thing that we need to talk about? We have continuous and animated. Well, I've been using continuous, and continuous runs all the time. If you set it to animated, then that would be like if you have a character that's an animated character or something running on Blender's normal timeline, it will only run while Blender's animation system is running. So there you have it. We're on frame 17. As long as it's running, and it doesn't care what frame you're on in this mode, it's just every time a frame changes, it will update. So it's updating continuously as long as animation is running. So there you have that. You have reset, which puts it back to its original state. You have reset selected. So like if this is running and I want to set just a portion of it back to its original state, I do reset selected, it will take that part back. Let's set the wrap force back to zero. So now I've reset this part and it's going to pull back to just whatever if you do select all and reset selected it resets the whole thing and so there's that uh, vertex group refresh is like let's say that i want to pin something so let's pin this section of it so i've got all these vertex groups the mc pin group which is generated automatically if i set that at a weight of one and i assign it um well it's not going to do anything yet because I haven't refreshed the fact that that vertex group is pinned. But now that vertex group that I pinned is going to be held in place. So if you remember right, I pinned that section over there. Basically, since there's no efficient way to update the vertex groups in real time, I put in a button, otherwise it would cause a serious performance hit, and that has to do with the Blender Vertex Group API, which doesn't play well with Python. Um, and I've actually talked to some of the Blender developers about that, and they said, yeah, whatever, that's your problem. They don't seem interested in fixing that for us Python developers. So for now you have a button. Um, hook selected. You can create hooks. Like, uh, well, first of all, let's set all the pin weights back to zero. And, of course, we have to refresh that again. And now they all are set at zero. And let's, I want to pin this section of it, or hook this section of it, so I'm going to create a bunch of hooks. And now out here on the outside world, I have all these cool hooks that I created that I can use now. Blender will let me select them. To manipulate my cloth in whatever way I want to. So these are points that I can use permanently. I can, you know, make them childs of a child objects of a character or whatever. And this is places that are my cloth is now hooked to that I can manipulate out here in the outside world of object mode. And let's see. Um type. Delete. All right, I deleted those, and now it just goes back to its normal self. And then, just in case you couldn't see that very well, create a few hooks over here. Uh, hook selected. And now these are control points that I can use to mess with my cloth out here. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's what hook selected does. And if I delete them, and they just go away now. So that's a little bit better UI than what I had before. Um, recording. I can now cache frames 
and overwrite and playback and delete and stuff and this probably needs a whole new separate tutorial but basically when you're working with high resolution data animations and stuff and it takes a long time to calculate you can now record everything and cache it and I'll just have to make a tutorial for that part separately um, this is for forces velocity which slows down the movement of everything gravity which makes everything fall um, I'm gonna make a oh let's make a microscope to demonstrate these effects a little bit more easily uh, running gravity obviously makes it fall inflate makes it blow up like a balloon or deflate it'll make it pull sort of smaller it just sort of pulls on the normals and now we're pulling negative on the normals which means that the normals have actually flipped inside out and I can't remember how to display normals. Where is it? Down here? Yes. Is it actually showing? No, it's not showing the normals. I don't remember. Anyway, the normals have turned inside out because it's deflated backwards and it's turned inside out. So that just puts pressure in the direction, oh, there it is, in the direction of the normals. So there's inside out and there's right side out again and yeah and so that's what inflate does uh, there's really cool things you can do with inflate you have wind and so there's this wind vector currently it's just a positive x wind vector and you can change the turbulence amount so it gives it a randomness to the wind so it will change the strength randomly if you give it a little bit of all three vectors, x, y, and z, or whatever, and then you set a random direction to it, it will sort of change the strength and direction. So it'll randomly blow different strengths and in different directions. That might be really cool for like a waving flag or a tent blowing in the wind or whatever. So yeah, random direction, turbulence, and then the wind vector. and zero and I set those all back to zero give it back some velocity so did I oh I took it away again all right uh, subframes this is for like when you're working with animation mode and you want your I guess I should run this in animation mode for demonstration purposes. You want your character um, to animate more realistically with the cloth, then you can set the number of subframes. And what it does is it affects the relative real world speed. So if I calculate subframes, this is going to run relatively faster. So I want to set that to run at a speed that makes it more, look more realistic with my character. And that's for using animated characters with cloth. Now, keep in mind, as you set the subframes up, then the performance goes down. And you'll want to probably cache your animations if you want to use that mode. So that's what subframes does. Stretch affects, you know, how stretchy the cloth is or how stiff it is. Push springs. Oh, you can set the push springs down and that will cause the cloth to pull on itself but not push on itself and you can get some weird effects if you want to play with that extra bend it has to do with uh, bending springs that run separate from the self collisions if you want to play with that and see what it does you're welcome to do that if you want to set the bend springs um, higher or lower then obviously you're going to get stiffer well, uh, stiffer fabric or more floppy fabric. So there it's set really stiff. Uh, sew force and sew ins. Can't remember what sew ins does. I'll have to make a tutorial later. Target length is interesting. 
So let's set the gravity to zero and I'll show you what this does. Okay, so here I've got my cloth. I'm gonna turn my bend springs down for performance. One thing that I really like is that I can take this and duplicate it and it just keeps running. Now I have, so I can edit geometry and stuff while I am running the cloth, which is super cool, which I couldn't do before. Now I can do that kind of stuff. Uh, so let's create some sew springs. And I can create sew springs while it's running too. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting away with something. Turn the velocity down here so we can see a little bit better what's going on. It's trying to sew together, which is why it's doing that. Because I created these springs at the other end. All right, so okay, now you can see what's going on here. These sew springs are trying to hook together. And they're currently annoying me, so I'm going to get rid of them. Okay, and then let's sew these edges together using the sew lines. Oh, is it? No. I don't even know what it created there. So let's just start over. All right. Oh, well, my animation is still running. I don't need that. Okay. Duplicate that. Make this cloth. Sew these guys. Well, let's set it running. Let's sew these guys together. And now it's going to try to sew together. If you, you can set the sew force up and down. It'll make it sew stronger or lesser. And if you do target length, then it's going to sew to whatever that target length is set at. Let me reset that so you can see what I'm talking about. So now the sew springs are going to sew up to whatever your target length is, and they're going to stop. Maybe a better way to demonstrate that would be to add some gravity here. Okay, so it's falling. It's sewn together. And I can set the target length to something shorter. And it will target a given length and stop there. And I just thought that might be something somebody might want to do. If you set the sew force all the way to one, then it will s theoretically um, sew all the way together. What do I have self collisions on? Yeah, I do. Apparently, I have some bugs to work out. Oh, it's because I set so ends or something. Oh, dynamic ends. That was something for another purpose. All right, so maybe turn dynamic ends off. Um, okay, let's go over the pin groups. Oh, hey, that thing's still there. Sorry, the, the vertex groups is what I meant. All right, so we have our cloth. Um, we have these settings down here. Pin selected, stretch selected, bend, etc. And let's get it running. All right, so we're running. Honestly, I am kind of annoyed by looking at the or er, almost turning that off. Now, if I want to control the vertex groups over here, I can, uh, like I showed before, but I have to update them. So there's just another way to do it. I just put another UI for this over here that is supposed to work in real time. Um, so it's falling and I have this selected, so this is not falling. Um, but if I want it to be fixed in place, then I can pin selected, and now it stays there. So whatever I just pin stays there. Like I could, you know, if I let go of that, it falls. But if I pin selected, 
and it stays. And I can pin select it with a smaller force, like something like that. And I'm going to pull on it over here and hit pin selected. Now it has this really small weight. Well, it's pinned, but it's pinned with a different amount of strength. It's going to go back to the location that it pinned it at. So you can pin with different forces. Like I could, let's pin this with a 0 0.04. And now, you know, this one's fixed in place. It's 100%, but that one's pinned with a smaller percentage. And I'm going to reset that because I want to see what that looks like. So, yeah, this is 100%. This is that smaller percentage. Um, the other pin weights, let's just set everything pinned to zero. And now everything will just fall, which is kind of what I wanted. OK, that's more like what I wanted. And we're going to pin that selection. So now that side is permanently pinned in place. And now we can control the stretch springs, for example. Let's make sure this is working. I, there may have been some changes to Blender where this doesn't work exactly like I wanted, and I will have to fix that bug. But let's like take the stretch springs right here, and let's pin that, or let's set them to something really low. So now stretch selected. And I think I have to pop in and out of edit mode. Maybe it's not working. OK, well, there's a bug there I'll have to fix. Uh, the idea is you can get. Um, okay, so that's my stretch pin group. That should be way more stretchy. And it's not probably because I have to fix something. I will fix that. Uh, the bend pin group, we can do the same thing. We can set the bend stiffness to something really tiny here. Let me set it to zero. And say bend selected. And now when we look at the bend group, OK, so that's actually working. Now um, we have part of the cloth is really bend stiffy, and part of the cloth is really not bend stiff. So if we turn this bend stiffness up, you can see that. So this part over here is really stiff, but this part over here is really floppy because it has different bend weights. So you can individually control the bend springs on your mesh that way. Um, mass uh, has to do with the stretch springs. And if you set the mass really like low for this section, for example, then the middle is going to move with velocity in a different way than the outer portion of it. And apparently it has a little bit of a bug. So I'll have to fix that too. So I've got some work to do still. Um, but those are the really boring extra, all this extra stuff that you can do. And hopefully you skipped this part of the video. But if not, um, you can play with those things, and I will fix the bugs that I discovered in this tutorial. And there you have it. That's the new version of Modeling Cloth. If you have questions about this, you can email me. The links to donate or to buy or whatever, all the relevant information is going to be in the description for this video. If you stuck with me this long, hey, kudos. That's pretty amazing. I will make more comprehensive tutorials, Lord willing if I have the time, and maybe we'll make a t-shirt or something cool. So, the end.